Okay, questions? I have kind of a general question um, for the panel, and um, because I actually work in a uh, run along the Mexican border, and when I was in Chiapas just a couple of weeks ago, one of the things that I see as a problem is that there is, you know, you say Mexico has to take a stand on this, but there's neither the political will nor the economic resources, particularly in the state of Chiapas, to be able to do much with that. And so it seems to me, it's nice to be able to say that, but I'm not sure what, I, I know, this is like the todo el tiempo, it's the, the problem. Um, and then the other issue, kind of going with the, the situation within Guate, Guatemala itself, is that there seems to be, uh, and you talk about the lack of uh, protection and the national police and the military are doing basically the continuation of the civil war. And I wonder how much of that is rooted within the racism about the indigenous people not really being complete citizens of their country. Yeah. Uh, comment, question, thought, whatever. <laughs> No, I totally agree that it's, it's the lack of political will. Mexican government is just, like the U.S. pretty much, just reacting to what is happening and not really having a vision and trying to see, well, what is going to happen with the economy, the labor, and the demography of Mexico, the United States, and Central America in the next 20 years, and how we are going to connect everything for the U.S. economy to be successful, for Mexico to be successful. Migration is a very sensitive issue, and everybody is trying to avoid, to solve. But now, and the other thing about the uh, economic resources, I, I will debate that Mexico, if we have the political will, can do a lot more in the south of Mexico and also can really help more Central American countries. Yeah. But that's, we can debate that. <laughs> yeah, just a quick comment on the racism in Guatemala, which I agree with your comment. Guatemala is about half Mayan, and it's its own for lack of a better word, it's almost like a caste system that there's a lot of discrimination and racism uh, against the Maya in Guatemala. Uh, in many places, they're not allowed to go into hotel lobbies or restaurants, whatever. And in fact, one of the, the great things for, for them in their migration is coming to the U.S. They, they leave that behind. And now they're a new minority here is Everybody calls them Latinos because they're from Guatemala, though the Maya don't, don't know what, a, you know, they see themselves as naturales, you know, mm -hmm. original people. So, but you're exactly right that the big, the big barrier here is not just that the government needs to do more or whatever, but that there is an enduring racism. And it was precisely because of the, the Maya protesting in terms for constitutional reform to give them more rights that they, then the, the army and the police came in and started shooting and actually killed some. policy, trade policy, and the drug policies have caused much of the turmoil in uh, Honduras, uh, Salvador, and elsewhere. Don't you feel that the United States government should be doing more for these children instead of willingly? I mean, it seems like they're eager to deport these kids, violating their due process. And when it is our government that caused the issues in their countries to begin with. Yeah, I, I, th I think, and I know a lot of my colleagues agree that the children should be, should, should, should be taken through due process, right? That well, we have laws already and that they should be used with the children to see, okay, well, who really qualifies for refugee status or asylum, whatever, right? Rather than Congress trying to you know, set a new record of how fast can we deport them, right? And I understand that we're not going to, there's no way you can accept everyone who comes to the border. We, we have to implement laws, but that's precisely what I think a lot of people that I work with, lawyers, pro bono, whatever, are saying they need to be, to have access to the laws, and those who qualify to stay here should stay here. And every year we get 60,000 or more refugees from the Middle East or Africa or whatever, and so we, it surprises us to think that we can get refugees from Central America because we supported a lot of those governments, and by that I mean their militaries, right? And so I don't think people are saying every kid should be allowed to stay. Some people are, and I understand that, that compassion, but what we're saying is let them have access to the law that's already here, 
and not be in a race to see how fast we can deport them. I think too, as sociologists, we know that there's always some unintended consequences of actions. And many of the laws that we've passed rapidly or out of fear or out of uh, political expediency uh, have serious consequences that people haven't thought through. And I think this is an issue that needs research, it needs uh, you know, a lot of analysis before we make policies that are humane policies, that respect human rights and that respect the legal processes of people. But there are unintended consequences with many of our actions. Next question in the back to the red sweater. Uh, yes, with regards to the dramatic drop in the number of um, unaccompanied Mexican children who have been out of along the border, I'm interested in your thoughts on the 2011 Mexican law having an impact on that, or perhaps being a causal factor of the, the decrease in unaccompanied Mexican children. I'm just wondering if you can explain what what aspects of the law or what, how the implementation of the law might be contributing to that. Or did I misunderstand your comments? Uh, uh, probably because the, the law is more about immigration and the exit and interest of Mexican nationals is not really yeah, that's why I was not uh, uh, actually no it's, it's not it's not connected uh, actually since I was in the negotiations of the law because it was a more complex subject to discuss Mexican out migration to the U.S. and the role of the government to provide services outside, let's say, in the United States. That part was uh, pretty much out of discussion during the law, and it's something that is still pending to see how Mexico is going to really approach, uh, as, uh, from a policy perspective, the, the out migration and the huge di diaspora that we have in this country. Do you have a question here in the front? Um, in regard to Puerto Vallarta, it, it looks almost like uh, America anyway. And uh, we go down to Chiapas, and of course things are a lot worse. Is it a question of economics? And this is a parallel to the question. Uh, if it's a question of economics, is it a possibility that we are, uh, are as Mexico becomes more democratized? as in the other countries that the people will enjoy better conditions there? And can we in the United States, if so, how can we help them uh, in that process? Oh, that's a, that's a very good uh, and difficult question. The, the south part of Mexico, as you probably know, has the largest percentage of indigenous population in Mexico, compared with central part and the north, which is totally different. I think what they have lagged behind is the provision of services, important services, especially still fertility is high in those states compared with the national average, which is already around 2.4 children per woman, but they still have four or five, which put a lot of pressure also on the resources there. And the investment on education and health is not the same in those states than in the rest of the country. It's a huge challenge for Mexico what to do with the southern part of Mexico and has been honestly totally neglected for the last 25 years to 30 years. Yeah. Um, next question here in the green shirt. Um, would it help to have a guest worker program like Canada has? Is that, would that be a help part of the multi solution? We used to have a bad one. <laughs> Yes, well, we did have some guest worker programs like the Bracero program, uh, which was exploited in many ways on both sides of the border. But some kind of temporary work program, I think, would help because many of these families don't want to leave their country of origin. They just want an opportunity to have, a, a, you know, gain a stake, an economic stake, go back or gain skills and go back to their communities where their extended families are, where they feel comfortable, where their roots are, their culture is. So if we could provide some opportunities, because there are many jobs here that we need to fill. And th I think that some uh, guest worker program that is carefully monitored so that the workers are not exploited and they're not treated as slaves, as sometimes that happens in some communities or some, some countries, that uh, it might help in some ways. Yeah. I would just second that. Uh, and I know that Mexico has uh, some kind of guest worker program with Canada. Mm -hmm. And so that, that seems to work. But Canada also does their immigration a little bit differently. They do it by a point system based on 
how many college mm -hmm. degrees you have, things like that. So that would only help the, the upper echelon of society. How has private investments of retirement homes in Central America and native communities uh, disrupted public policing in Central America? I mean, you have the privatization of, of policing that's happening with the gay communities. I'm wondering if that's also contributing to the need for a gang organization and um, an alternative to the, the, the vacuum that's happening as a result of it. So are you saying like the rich are better protected because they have their private police? Right, and, and then also you have uh, retirement communities coming in from the U.S. Yeah. to establish, to, 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 to invest in this thing. That's true, yeah. I mean, they're obviously in many of the, uh, the upper class sectors, right, have more privileges, better they send their children to U.S. schools and things like that, and so that the rest of society is, doesn't have those resources, obviously, right, and are maybe deprived of it, right? So, yeah. Next question, in the white. Uh, Mr. Santana, I'm yes. question. Um, you know, you talk about the organized crime, and you know, I, I got the impression that you're talking about two issues. One side is the business, if you will, is the illegal immigration, the other side is the drug portion of it. Do you see them as separate entities that have hand in hand? If you fix one, you fix the other? Or how do you view it? Because it, it's the first time I've ever heard someone really talk about organized crime making illegal immigration business. For a long time, they were separate business. Yeah, I mean, smuggling migrants and organized crime. But for reasons that are still hard to understand, organized crime started to really see the opportunities that other business were there for them when they were controlling already territories, especially in the borders, in the Mexican northern border cities, Ciudad Juarez, Tijuana. They started to control those who were stolen, stealing cars. They were trying to control all kind of delinquency in the cities. And the smugglers were part of that at some point. And also they realized, not only because of Central American migrants, and this is something I know from my own expertise when I work in the government, is to bring migrants from India, China, uh, East Asia, to the United States, to very complex networks. It's a huge international business. And organized crime in Mexico, like the Zetas, especially the Zetas, is starting to see, to see the opportunity there, and they started to act. And one of the main factors to really open more the understanding of migration and to have more access and more order in the way migration flows is that you will really hit a very huge business today of human traffic that is connected to organized crime. I'm not saying that everybody who is a smuggler is a CETA drug cartel guy or is really uh, involved in organized crime. but. Very important territories of Mexico are controlled by them, and they had to pay a fee to really cross those territories. And in the case of Tamaulipas, which is true, they control who crosses the border or not to the United States, two drug cartels. They are not coyotes or smugglers that we used to know in the past. Actually, some friends of ours were scholars that used to go to the border and talk to the coyotes and smugglers to see how that business worked. They cannot do it anymore. They don't have access to that because, well, it would be very dangerous for them to really go to the border and do that kind of research. Yeah, so. so. It was like before the smugglers would just pay the cartels to cr cross through their territory, but now it's gone beyond that. The cartels have begun to actively organize the actual yeah. smuggling. But it's more than smuggling. And in some cases, they, they hold people back for ransom and they make them call their mm -hmm. families to get, to be that. set free. And so it's, it's, it's smuggling, but it's also kidnapping and all of it. It's very lucrative because of the high volume of migration. Uh, we just returned from the American Sociological Association, and at one of the sessions, uh, they reported on research that showed that some of the coyotes, who are the border crossers, uh, different from the ones that bring the people from the internal areas up to the border, were collaborating with the, the the gang members and the, the 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 drug cartels to allow the people that they're transporting to be robbed, so that they knew where these people were going to cross. They knew where they were going to be, and the robbers would come in and take their money 
and the, the Coyote Crossing never got robbed. So they're thinking, they're hearing these stories from the migrants crossing that there's definitely some kind of collaboration. It's definitely a, an economic enterprise that's going on that's also contributing to this. Just as a footnote, I mean, kidnapping has become like the new booming business. And it's even for, for small criminals. I mean, kidnapping the barber's son or kidnapping the guy who, the mechanic's daughter for $200 or something like, quickly, you know. So it's, it's a new booming business for, for, in crime. Next question in the back. Linda, Paolo, I don't know what you were just saying. Um, what about children? And, you know, you have the increase in children coming over, and how have the drug cartels and everything perhaps used the children you know, as smuggled or something. So how, you know, can you talk about what you know about children being particularly vulnerable to that kind of activity um, crossing over? Do you want to come? Well, I would just say that completely agree with, with Renée's assessment that smuggling the children is, is, is very profitable for the cartels. But not, there are many children who also come on their own. They come on the train, on top of the train. Not, and it's a cargo train, not a passenger train. And so some of this are outside the protection of a smuggler or a cartel, and they get assaulted and robbed and, and even, even murdered. Uh, so that because there are many different ways through which children migrate, they, they are vulnerable to different dangers during the journey. But the ones that are smuggled theoretically may be more protected because they're, they've made payment, they're, they're coming with a guide, and the cartels are going to see that they get delivered to the border. has changed dramatically and it's it's very difficult for people to cross for legitimate reasons and our immigration policy is very flawed it's been piecemeal and uh, changes that don't agree with other changes so we do need comprehensive immigration reform that will allow people to come and go that was a big criticism of NAFTA that we allowed goods to come and go, but nobody addressed, because it was too politically sensitive, the issue of people coming and going. Let me just say that uh, it, you know, I, my doctoral dissertation was on labor migration in the history of the world economy, going back to the 1600s. Final conclusion is that the world has always been open for capital migration, but it's usually and often restricted for workers to move, right? And, to, to let workers come from Central America to the U.S. defeats the plan, the larger plan of capitalist development because we want those workers to stay poor in Central America so they can be low wage and create our shirts and our whatever we just, you know, bananas that we buy at H-E-B or whatever, you know. When the workers come here, they contradict capital because now they want the same wages you and I have. And we just, not, it's, it's hard to think we can let that happen. That, that's not a good policy for capital, capitalism. Well, I, I think that when you look at the Senate bill that was approved uh, as an immigration uh, comprehensive immigration reform, but it has pretty much lost in the, in the lower house, you will see how the agricultural producers did an amazing lobby in the bill to really foresee what is next. What is coming, not only about s s 
solving what is the crisis now, which they are facing in California especially, but the need for labor in the future. And they talk about a blue card, a blue card that will allow Mexican workers to cross the border and come to the field, even if they live in Mexico. They still I, I hard believe that one in the U.S., that everybody that wants to come and work here wants to come and live here and wants to follow the American dream, which is true for most migrants. But there are many, many migrants that they would like the opportunity to just to come and cross for a few months, make enough income, and have a good life in Mexico. Why Mexico doesn't fight more for that kind of visas and extensions of special visas for Mexico is a big question for me. But also, if you want to look as a good example how to see a very organized labor for a specific sector, look at everything that agricultural producers really negotiated in the Senate bill, very different than other sectors, yeah, that didn't see, at least they were not as active or organized like they were. That's a very good example of how things can operate in the future in a very organized labor market between at least Mexico and the U.S. and Central America. I'm afraid that's going to have to be our last question. Thank you very much for the questions for panel one, and we'll continue in 15 minutes. Uh, we've, we've got a great panel of community people.